Okay, I um, guess I'll give just another minute or two as people trickle in, um, but in the meantime, I can introduce myself. I'm John, I'm the TA for this class, as I'm sure most of you know already, um, although I know some of you are fresh faces. Um, I'm Danny's TA, uh, I work for him, with him at the Romero Institute, um, where I do research and grant writing and stuff like that. Um, <clears throat> A little housekeeping, um, if you haven't uh, gotten a syllabus already, we've got a few more up here. Um, you can come grab one. They're also available online at danielpsheehan.com. Um, and in fact, this is where the live version of the syllabus lives, so you should all be going here to check it out because it's got all the links, um, unlike the paper syllabus, because it's paper. Um, uh, this one also has a full description of every lecture's um, uh, contents, well, most of the lecture's contents. Um, and we've also got some flyers up here if anybody's interested in uh, interning for us. We have a great intern program and our intern coordinator is sitting at the back. Um, <laughs> anyway, so uh, I guess we can get started here. Um, so today I'm going to be presenting a little bit about the, uh, the facts, the scientific facts about climate change, just to kind of get everyone started off on the right foot. Can everyone hear me? Okay. Like before? Yeah? Okay. Yeah. <laughs> Did not get you. Um, so just to, I know that everyone's probably got a different background here, you know, whether, you know, you've, you, you had high school, you know, physics and chemistry five years ago or however many years ago. <laughs> um, I want to make sure that we all are on the same page about what we're talking about here so that we can understand what we're really talking about when we're talking about the impacts of climate change and the policies of climate change, because otherwise we can't properly address it. if We don't understand what we're talking about, right? So... Um, this is just a, an overview, and um, I'm going to try to, you know, climate change is a big, complicated topic with a lot of scientific jargon, but I'm going to try to keep it as, as simple and jargon-free as possible. And um, I set an alarm, so I, we're definitely going to have questions at the end of class today. Uh, and we, I'm also going to be holding office hours this week in uh, Cal room uh, 132, so just across the way. Uh, that's this Thursday after class. Um, so today's lecture is going to focus on what climate change is, uh, what its causes are, and the evidence that proves that we're responsible this time. Um, on Thursday, I'm going to be going over some of the most kind of important environmental impacts of climate change. Today is, is more about what it is and, and how do we know that, that it's happening. Um, so before I jump in to all this, I want to just take a step back because climate change is a huge problem and it's so big, it's hard to think about. It's, it's abstract, it's complicated, there's a lot of little details, and everything's all interconnected. And so how do you really understand it? You have to look at the Earth as a whole. You have to take back, take a look at our first kind of selfie, global selfie here. Um, so part of the reason why climate change is so bad is because it's kind of, the scale is so big. Um, but it's really not abstract. And it's real, and it's as inevitable a consequence of physics and chemistry as this pen hitting the table is, is gravity. Uh, it can only be properly understood in context. So let's take a small step back and consider the following. Right now, you're sitting in a chair on a ball of rock and metal that's about 8,000 miles across, that's spinning caught in the gravity well of a giant nuclear explosion that's constantly bombarding us with 278 trillion watt hours of photons, and that's 278 followed by 12 zeros worth of photons uh, every hour, <laughs> about a third of which bounce off the hair-thin atmosphere that we have, the blanket of gases that protects us and lets us be alive. Um, so about a third of the photons bounce off that, and the rest of them hit the surface, or they're, they hit the atmosphere, different layers of the atmosphere, and they, they warm it up. Um, and that gives us, you know, the, the nice blue color, the nice shine, you know, keeps us nice and, and warm and happy. Um, and it drives all the things that make our climate tick and our planet tick, you know, photosynthesis, erosion, evaporation, ocean currents, wind patterns, everything that, that goes into making our planet tick largely comes from either, you know, radioactive decay within the planet or from the sun. So that's kind of the, the earth in a nutshell. And it's been around for a while and it's been good to us, but we haven't been good to it. And so we need to understand what we're doing. And what is climate change? Climate change is changes in the Earth's climate. And what is climate? Well, it's not weather. Weather is, it's sunny outside today, maybe cloudy tomorrow. But Santa Cruz has a Mediterranean climate, right? So we have kind of mild winters that are wet and then kind of warm, dry summers. That's, that's our climate. Um, 
And it's driven, or changes in that, that climate system are driven by energy imbalances between the energy that's coming in from the sun and the energy that's being radiated back out into space by the Earth. Um, so the more energy you have coming in, uh, you need to have an equal amount coming out, otherwise you're going to be driving a change in one direction or the other, right? You're going to be either cooling the planet or warming the planet. So the more energy, if you have more energy coming in than going out, then you're warming. If you have more energy going out than coming in, then you're cooling. And that's happened before, actually. The global cooling, it happened about seven, 640 million years ago, and about, again, about 710 million years ago. And that was what scientists call a snowball Earth or a slushball Earth, because there's still some debate as to whether or not the equator froze over. Because it would be really hard to get out of a snowball Earth type scenario. And it, so these types of extreme climate changes, one direction or another, very hard to get back to a stable middle point once you get out of them. Um, and, but that raises the point of, well, OK, so the climate's always been changing, right? Yes, it has. The climate is constantly changing. It's undergoing natural changes, and some of them are you know, what, we would, what we would label good, and some of them are what we would label bad. Um, but what we're talking about today is anthropogenic climate change, that is, climate change that's caused by us. Um, but other natural climate changes have uh, driven mass extinctions in the past. In fact, the, the largest mass extinction in Earth's history, the uh, Paleo-Triassic extinction, or the Great Dying, resulted in the extinction of about 96% of marine species. And things on Earth were a bit different then. We had Pangaea instead of all the nice continents that we had today. Uh, and there was massive volcanic activity in what is today Siberia, and it released a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, and, but this happened over about 60,000 years. So we've been doing this since you know, the Industrial Revolution, and really we've only been ramping up our carbon emissions since you know, the 60s or so. So we're, we're, we're coming up um, pretty quick. And so under a business as usual emissions scenario, this is a quote from a, uh, one of the scientists that performed this study, um, by 2100, warming in the upper, upper ocean will have approached 20% of warming in the late Permian, and by the year 2300, it will reach between 35 and 50%. This study highlights the potential for a mass extinction arising from a similar mechanism under anthropogenic climate change. So, just to recap, <laughs> the worst mass extinction in Earth's history was caused by climate change that was about a thousand times slower than what we're doing now. Yikes. <laughs> um, <laughs> So this is a conceptual model with some numbers attached showing the energy balance of the Earth, right? So we've got up here, I think I've got my oh, pointer. So up here we've got uh, the incoming solar radiation at the top of the atmosphere. So picture the planet at the very top of the atmosphere. You've got solar radiation coming in. Some of that, about 100 units, 100 watts per meter squared of that, gets reflected off immediately. So it just goes boink right back into space. And that's what gives us that nice shine that we had in our planetary selfie. Um, and then the rest of it comes down and interacts with either the atmosphere or the planet, uh, the Earth's surface in some way, gets absorbed and comes back out as thermal energy. Uh, and, but you can see that the numbers don't quite add up. 340 minus 100 minus 239 is not zero, and that's what it should be, but it's, it's not. <laughs> and that's because of greenhouse gases in this atmospheric window here, the infrared absorption band. What are greenhouse gases? You, I have no doubt <laughs> familiar with greenhouse gases, um, but you may not understand the exact physical chemical mechanism that goes into making them greenhouse gases, and that's really important. So basically, greenhouse gases are gases that selectively absorb one type of uh, electromagnetic radiation. That's, that is just energy carried by photons. Um, and they absorb in the infrared spectrum more so than in the higher wavelengths. So like a lot of what comes out of the sun is in higher wavelengths, but a lot of what comes out of the Earth as heat infrared radiation heat is absorbed by these molecules. So basically a photon will come in, point, and hit the atom or the, the, the bond between the atom and the molecule and cause it to just wiggle and jiggle a little bit faster. And that wiggling and jiggling is what we experience as heat. So it heats them up. It causes them to have more energy. And when in balance, their presence in the atmosphere helps keep our planet nice and, and habitable. Um, but too low or too high of a concentration, you get something like Mars or Venus. Mars' gravity is too weak to contain its atmosphere to its planet, so slowly it's dissipated over time. I don't know if you've, slide aside, I don't know if you've seen the movie The Martian or read the book. Uh, it completely could not happen, and the, the author was like, yeah, I know it's all BS, but because they get caught in a storm on Mars in the beginning and their spaceship gets knocked over, and the Earth's, or the, Mars' atmosphere just isn't dense enough to push over anything. Like, you couldn't lift up a piece of paper with wind on Mars. <laughs> 
So knocking over a spaceship or like blowing Matt Damon out of you know, whatever an airlock is just completely ridiculous. Anyway, so um, Mars has an uh, uh, atmosphere about uh, 0.6% of Earth's atmosphere at mean sea level. And very little of that is any kind of greenhouse gas. So it's freezing. It's, well, it's very hot or very cold. It ranges from about 70 degrees Fahrenheit to negative 100 degrees Fahrenheit day and night cycles. Venus, on the other hand, has an atmosphere uh, about 10 times denser than Earth. Yeah. Um, and consequently has surface temperatures exceeding 180 degrees Fahrenheit. So hot enough to melt lead. Basically, you, you, you walk around, you'll burst into flames. <laughs> so you really, you want to keep it somewhere in this nice Goldilocks zone that we've gotten for ourselves. Um, oh, so that's, that was Mars and this is Venus. And you can see the difference. On Mars, you can see straight down to the planet's surface. You can kind of see that very, very thin layer of atmosphere. And then it, on Venus, you can't even see down to the surface. Um, so if you were looking down at the, the atmosphere of Earth and you had, you know, a, a spectrolytic analyzer, you could see what, uh, what radiation is coming out of the Earth. And that's, this is what it would look like if you were looking down from the top of the planet and you could see all the different types of wavelengths of photons that were coming off the planet. Um, and right in the middle here, you can see there's a big gap. And that's, that's right about where the infrared absorption band is. So that's where the greenhouse gases are acting. So they basically act like a, like a big mirror. Well, not a mirror, but just a big block that, that prevents that heat, that infrared radiation from coming off the planet. And that's, that's the signature. Um, and those are caused by different greenhouse gases. And I yeah, actually had it on the little label here. So carbon dioxide, water, ozone, oxygen. And you may think, well, you know, those are greenhouse gases. Yeah, those are greenhouse gases. They're just more kind of natural, naturally occurring greenhouse gases as opposed to, um, you know, things like halogenated gases, which are completely man-made. So these are various types of greenhouse gases. And these are kind of the main ones. We've got carbon dioxide, methane, nitrous oxide, halogenated gases, which are just hydrocarbons, so carbon and hydrogen, like methane, just carbon and hydrogen, um, plus a halogen or a couple of halogens. And those are fluorine, chlorine, bromine, or iodine. The, the bigger ones kind of radioactively de decay, so they aren't in a lot of molecules. Um, and each one of these has a different global warming potential. So that is, they absorb different amounts of energy as they're struck by these photons coming out of the Earth. Carbon dioxide is not actually that powerful. There's just a lot of it. Um, so we set it at one. So we set everything else relative to carbon. So you'll see like carbon dioxide equivalents or CO2E, you'll see that, that nomenclature a lot. That's what this was referring to, this kind of concept, is that carbon dioxide is set at the baseline. Anyway, so methane has, over 20 years, has a glo global warming potential, GWP, of about 84 times greater than carbon dioxide. Uh, but over 100 years, that drops to about 28 times greater than carbon dioxide. And that's because methane only has a lifespan in the atmosphere of about 12.4 years. Otherwise, it gets decayed by ozone and radiation into uh, carbon dioxide and water. So methane will decay into an, actually another greenhouse gas. So it's not you know zero when it drops down. Um, nitrous oxide ha has a fairly long lifespan and about 264 times uh, more uh, gr greenhouse or global warming potential than um, carbon dioxide. And then finally, the H gases. These are, again, like artificial gases, and they're mostly used in industrial processes, and so it's actually a little bit easier for us to phase them out over time because they're, you know, it's not like you're driving your car and blasting out HFC 13-4A. <laughs> Hopefully, I don't know. Um, but where are they coming from? I'm not going to get super into the weeds on specific greenhouse gas sources because there's just a lot of them, and it's not really worth uh, the time right now. Um, but this is basically a global breakdown of, of where they are coming from. And um, so this is going to get a little bit interactive. Uh, <laughs> can anyone tell me where, what they might think that energy emissions would come from? Because this is, uh, as you can see, far and away, you know, 40 gigatons of carbon in 2014. Um, that's quite a bit. So what are, what are some energy emissions? Coal. Coal, yeah, absolutely. Natural gas is another one. Oh, uh, you know, everything, well, these lights here are running pretty clean, um, but uh, driving around in your car, that's an energy, you know, you, it takes energy to move your car, um, and that's transportation and fossil fuel use are some of the, the biggest contributors to this particular segment. Um, agriculture, that would be things like uh, uh, changing the crop, one type of crop to another that maybe absorbs less carbon from the atmosphere. It's also things like cow burps, <laughs> uh, sheep burps, um, they have, uh, uh, ruminants, as they're called, cattle and sheep, they have a four-chambered stomach that produces a lot of methane as they digest their really undigestible food, cellulose. Um, 
So they produce a lot. Industrial processes, a lot of this, are th things like uh, a big chunk of this is um, concrete production or like building buildings. Uh, as concrete settles and dries, it releases actually a lot of carbon dioxide. Um, land use changes in forestry, we're burning down the Amazon. <laughs> uh, waste, this is landfill, so de decomposition that produces a lot of methane as, as things decompose. And then finally, bunker fuels. Gold star for anyone who can tell me what bunker fuel emissions are. <laughs> yeah, don't worry about it. Uh, <laughs> this is something, the, the, the reason why you can't answer this question is actually a political reason. Um, bunker fuels are, or bunker fuel emissions are the emissions released by international shipping routes. So basically these giant container ships that, that go back and forth and blast out, you know, their dirty diesel emissions across the international waters, basically no country wants to take credit for them. So we've kind of politically lumped them into their own little <laughs> thing, which we call bunker fuels. Anyway, not very important, but just an interesting aside about the politicization of the presentation of climate science, which comes into play a lot. So once you put a bunch of, you know, say, carbon dioxide up in the atmosphere, what happens to it? Does it just stay there? You know, does it, does it transform into something else? Does it fall back to the ground? Well, this is kind of what happens. So this is a, 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 a graph showing the results of a model, uh, an atmospheric model, um, simulating what would happen if you put one big pulse of carbon dioxide into the atmosphere. How long would it take for it to get out of the atmosphere, come out of the atmosphere? Um, and it actually turns out to depend on how much you initially put in because the Earth kind of has a, a filtering rate, you know, of how much carbon it can handle uh, and sequester back into the ground at, you know, at a given speed. So the more you put in, the systems kind of get overwhelmed and it takes a lot longer for it to, to be taken out. So you can see when you have, when you, if you did a pulse of, you know, say 5,000 petagrams of carbon, um, that's the same thing as a gigaton, a petagram and a gigaton. Whatever. It's in the notes. I'm, all the, these lectures, by the way, these lectures are going to be um, up in, on the live syllabus. So if you, and they've got a bunch of notes in the, whatever, in them. So feel free to uh, check it out after today when they'll be uploaded. Um, anyway, so after a thousand years, you get about 40% of that carbon out of, or eight, sorry, 60% of the carbon out of the atmosphere. You've got about 40% of it remaining. So it lasts for quite some time, I guess, is the point that, <laughs> that this is showing. It lasts for quite some time when you, when you burn fossil fuels when you, when you drive to work in your car. It stays up there for a long time. But eventually it does come down, and it comes down and it participates, well, it's already participating in what's known as the carbon cycle, and it's just how carbon cycles through the environment. Um, and I'm not gonna go into you know, every little detail here, but I did just you know, kinda wanna give you a sense of uh, once we put carbon dioxide into the atmosphere, what happens to it? You know, well, it can be absorbed, say, by a leaf. It can come into the stoma of a leaf of a tree and be, you know, move through all the mechanisms of photosynthesis, become incorporated into the plant tissues, plant tissues die, decompose into the soil, and that carbon gets passed to, say, a microbe. And that, you know, it takes the ball and it, you know, does its little thing, and then it dies and decomposes, becomes part of the soil. And then that soil, you know, say hypothetically, could get eroded by rain, or by overland flow, run off into the oceans, be eaten by a zooplankton, beaten by a fish, you know, with the fish dies and decays it itself, becomes marine snow, which settles down, et cetera, et cetera, you know, compactifies in the ocean, the deep ocean and layers where eventually thousands of years later it's settled or it's stirred up and then it's right, risen back to the surface. It's, it's a process. It's a whole long thing. And um, we, we are taking something out of long-term storage, these fossil fuels and cement production, we're taking it out of long-term storage and we're just dumping it up there and we're just, we're supercharging the cycle and it doesn't have the capacity to filter it out right away. And it takes a long time and it just changes a lot of things. And this is, a, this is another visualization of just showing the relative amounts of carbon in different stores throughout, uh, throughout the planet. Um, so the continental crust and the upper mantle is just far and away that that's where most of the carbon is because the earth is made of rock and there's a lot of carbon in rocks. Um, oop. Then what happened? Uh, and, then, and then next is the deep and intermediate ocean. So again, those ocean sediments, as things settle down, they get stored down there for a long time. And really the relative proportions of where the carbon is in the environment is reflective of how fast it moves in and out of that particular store. So, you know, if you lock it up in a rock, it's really not going anywhere. If you, if you sink it down to the bottom of the ocean, it's not going anywhere. But if you put it in the atmosphere, if you, you know, burn down your trees, if you, whatever, you know, if you mix it up in the surface oceans, it's going to have a faster turnover. And this is uh, kind of showing the same thing again. Um, I'm not going to go super into the weeds, but I did want to point out this net atmospheric increase of carbon, four gigatons per year. And 
if we think back to that to that pulse graph, you know, when you if you putting if you're putting in four gigatons per year, I mean, over a certain amount of years, it's not quite the same as the pulse, but you can see you can get a relative idea of how long it's going to take for all of this carbon that we're putting up each year to come out, and that changes things. It changes the carbon cycle. So when you burn fossil fuels, <laughs> you affect the ocean because the fossil fuels that you're burning release greenhouse gases, which heat up the, uh, the lower layers of the atmosphere and the planet's surface, as well as the ocean. And when you heat up the ocean, you reduce its ability to absorb dissolved gases, and it has a lot of carbon dioxide dissolved in it. So when you heat it up, it releases carbon dioxide. Dang, now you've got more carbon dioxide in your atmosphere. Well, we'll say it's, getting, it's still getting hotter, and your soil microbes are like, well, great, it's hot, it's wet because you know, rainfall patterns are shifting, I'm going to go into hyperdrive. I'm going to start decomposing stuff like crazy and producing a lot of methane and carbon dioxide. Oh, darn, you got more greenhouse gases in your atmosphere. <laughs> methane, ooh, methane clathrates are uh, it, they're ice that contains methane molecules. And they're like little tiny bubbles trapped in ice. And they're, they're uh, all around the, the poles, uh, particularly in the Arctic, um, where there's a lot of biological activity. And as soon as those holes heat up just a little bit enough for that ice to melt, that's a huge amount of methane into the atmosphere. Darn, you got more greenhouse gases in your atmosphere. <laughs> Peat bogs, marshes, wetlands, same thing. Increased decomposition rates. Rainforests, we're burning them down. They're just decomposing faster. And also, rainforests are not just, it's not just a pretty name. Rainforests make rain. They cause rain to, to fall in certain areas rather than others. And so they bring the rain to, you know, to the rainforest. And if we burn them down and they can't grow back, then the rain is gone and they, they can't ever grow back unless we you know, did some kind of massive geoengineering thing or change the climate even further. <laughs> uh, and then finally, permafrost. Permafrost is just permanently frozen soil, like Arctic tundra. Uh, so if you kind of scrape down the, the, the top layer of soil, it's just frozen solid. And that contains a lot of carbon, a lot of methane. And as that decomposes, as it gets warmer, again, more carbon dioxide, more methane in your atmosphere and it just gets hotter. So that's, these are what are known as feedback loops, where one thing plays into another and causes it to increase or decrease. So there's positive and negative feedback loops, and that's not a judgment call, that's like a positive go, you know, they increase, and negative feedback loops decrease. So these are all positive feedback loops because they're increasing the amount of carbon dioxide and methane in the atmosphere. Um, oh, uh, other types of feedback include albedo changes. So changes, uh, I don't know if you're familiar with the term albedo, but it's, um, it's how reflective any, anything is, uh, reflective an object is to, to light. So um, like for instance, this piece of paper has a very high albedo. It has an albedo close to one. And in fact, if, you know, if it was perfectly reflective, if it was a mirror, it would have an albedo of one. Whereas a black notebook has a very low albedo. And so if you think about what dirt looks like and what snow looks like, you can see that one of them is going to absorb a lot more light and a lot more heat than another. And so as the ice caps melt, they have a very high albedo, but the dirt underneath them has a very low albedo. So it's another one of these feedback cycles where the Earth will absorb more energy as ice melts and just get hotter, hotter faster. Um, so that's climate change. And here's the evidence that shows that we're the ones responsible for this time around. Uh, so, first of all, we're going to start with just some basic chemistry because that's really all you need to have a, kind of the fundamental understanding of, you know, we're doing something to the planet. Climate Chemistry 101. Welcome, you're all enrolled. Uh, can anybody tell me what happens when you combust hydrocarbons with a little bit of energy and oxygen? <laughs> CO2, and CO2 and water and a lot more energy and a little bit of other stuff, <laughs> um, so like partially combusted byproducts. But an inevitable consequence of the burning of hydrocarbons, and these are the components of gasoline. Some of the components of gasoline. Gasoline is just a cocktail of a bunch of nasty stuff. Um, but as you burn gasoline, you just, you release carbon dioxide. And there's no, if, you, if, if that's a hard point to understand, then come see me after class, because it's, some people seem to have trouble with it. You know, it's like, oh, well, you know, it's the, the carbon dioxide, it doesn't matter. You know, it, we're not really putting it up in the atmosphere. It's like, well, it's just basic chemistry. Yes, we are. Um, so, congratulations, you all graduated to Climate Chemistry 102. Can anybody tell me what happens when you mix carbon dioxide and water together? This one's a little bit more advanced. <laughs> well, I can tell you what you don't get. <laughs> I mean, <laughs> you do get this, actually, but you have to mix in the gas with the liquid. You don't 
they don't go together. Anyway, but really you get carbonic acid. And uh, so this is, it's a weak acid. Uh, it's, it's just a little bit weaker than like citric acid, but it still causes an effect. And this is just like basic chemistry that when you mix carbon dioxide and water together, you get carbonic acid. It happens in rain as it falls through the air. That's why rainwater has a low pH, if you ever tested the pH of rainwater. Um, it's also rainwater, you shouldn't, they say, you know, you shouldn't drink necessarily because each particle of rain condenses around a particle of soot or dust or something in the atmosphere. Uh, so they're all a little bit dirty. <laughs> um, but as this carbonic acid is produced in the, in the ocean, say, as the atmosphere above the ocean gets more and more concentrated and saturated with carbon dioxide, it increases the amount of carbonic acid in the water below. And that increases the acidity of the ocean. And we've measured that. <laughs> we can see that the oceans are getting more acidic. The oceans are normally slightly basic, so they're usually about um, like a pH of about eight, kind of fluctuates, but it's right about there. The, they're starting to trend down, so closer to like 7.8, you know, something like that. It doesn't seem huge, but again, the pH scale is a, uh, is a logarithmic scale, so dropping one unit is actually dropping a factor of 10, right? So, um, and ocean acidification doesn't just affect things that you would, you know, expect to, like, dissolve, like shelled creatures, or, you know, coral, things that, that are kind of carbonate-based, so they have, like, a shell on them. It also affects brain development <laughs> in juvenile fish. They can't hear as well because they have fossilized, uh, or they, they have um, ocelized, they have their bones, they have bones in their ears that get messed up by the acidity in the water and they can't hear as well and so they can't hear where to go, where to settle. They rely a lot on their hearing and so they die a lot more. And when you kill off the young of a population, you have instantly crippled that population and it takes a little while to recover. But instead of allowing them to recover, we're just making the oceans more and more acidic. Um, this is a, a GIF showing the average surface temperature of the world uh, over time across different uh, research stations. So the blue line is in Britain, that the Hadley Center. NOAA is here in the United States, the Japanese Meteorological Agency of Japan, um, Berkeley Earth. So these are different agencies around the world don't trust each other, because countries don't trust each other. Uh, and so they each want to take their own measurements. And so you can actually compare them pretty well together and show that actually, yes, the Earth is getting hotter because we're pumping greenhouse gases into the atmosphere. And you can see it around the world. You know, for People who have completely different ideologies, completely different politics, completely different cultures all show the same thing, that we are warming the planet. Don't believe me? Here's another graph. I mean, you probably saw this one from a couple years back, but this is just, uh, you know, people are trying to impress upon other, science communicators are trying to impress upon the general population how, you know, unprecedented this is. <laughs> so they make all kinds of, you know, neat visualizations like, up, oh, up, oh, almost to 1.5 degrees C, we almost made it. <laughs> Uh, and this is how temperature changes have uh, varied geographically throughout the world. So um, one thing to notice is it's getting hotter, you know. I mean, we're only up to the 60s right now, so it's not too bad. But you especially pay attention to the upper regions up here, the upper polar regions. They get pretty red near the end, but much more so than, than down here, actually. And that's something that comes into play later is that uh, unequal geographic distribution of, uh, of the global warming. So I just wanted to show this, um, this video real quick. It's just like three and a half minutes, um, but it's showing how Arctic amplification affects the polar vortex. And that may not be something that's affecting us today, but it is affecting other people in the country right, <laughs> right now. You know, th there's uh, more winter storms coming their way, which is like, you know, what, it's April. Um, but here's how that happens, basically. Over the past few decades, the surface air temperature of the Arctic region has been warming at a rate twice as fast as the global average. Accelerated Arctic warming is in part due to melting Arctic sea ice and snow cover. The region has also seen greater trends and variability in the ecosystem than the rest of the Northern Hemisphere. This phenomenon is known as Arctic amplification, and it's strongest in autumn and winter. To explain how Arctic amplification affects the polar vortex, Let's start by looking at the vortex in its stable or strong state. During the winter months, the polar vortex is a wide expanse of fast swirling cold air, flowing west to east in the stratosphere around an area of low pressure centered on the North Pole. 
Picture this area of low pressure as a bowl-shaped indentation of the stratosphere filled with cold air particles, shown here as blue dots. The heaviest and most dense of these cold air particles settle in the bottom of the bowl, weighing it down. When the vortex is strong, the cold air is confined inside the bowl, and the jet stream in the troposphere below it flows in a fairly regular path around the globe. Think of the jet stream as essentially dividing the cold air up north and the warm air down south. The large temperature difference keeps the jet stream on a straighter path, and weather patterns and storm tracks tend to be fairly normal and seasonal. During Arctic amplification, the increasingly warm air in the Arctic causes a kink in the jet stream over Eurasia. This sends warm air particles, shown here as red dots, into the bowl-shaped indentation from the sides, pushing towards its center and weakening the polar vortex. The hot air causes the pressure to rise over the North Pole, eventually inverting the shape of the bowl. During this redistribution of air masses, the cold air particles are displaced by the warmer air, rolling off and spilling away from the North Pole to the outer layers of the atmosphere in the mid-latitudes. In more extreme disruptions, the polar vortex splits into two daughter vortices. In this weakened state, air flows in a wavier fashion around the Arctic, meandering north and south, rather than flowing steadily west to east, and the redistribution of cold and warm air accelerates. The reduction in the temperature and pressure difference between the Arctic and the tropics robs the jet stream of some of its strength, causing it to meander, sometimes dramatically, to the north and south along its path. These large swings in the jet stream allow cold air to push further than usual into the southern portions of the hemisphere, creating weather events like Arctic air outbreaks and severe snowstorms, and warm air to penetrate deep into the Arctic, resulting in unusual Arctic heat waves. The profound changes to the Arctic system have coincided with a period of more frequent extreme weather events across the northern hemisphere's mid-latitude. The potential link between Arctic amplification and changes in extreme weather is a critical one, as this phenomenon can be expected to continue over the coming decade. And beyond. Yeah, so... Um, if you've ever been curious about how the polar vortex how it can become colder through global warming, that's how. Because there's cold spots on our planet, and there are always going to be cold spots on our planet. Um, but they move around <laughs> if, we, if we mess with them, basically. Um, let me get this back up to full screen here. Okay. Sorry about that. Um, <clears throat> okay, so um, we just showed how the polar vortex is tied to, to global warming. Um, but has, has anyone heard of stratospheric cooling? And this is a part of our planet that's actually consistently cooling. It's not like the polar vortex where it moves around. It's, it's actually factually getting colder and we've been measuring it for a long time. I'll give you a hint. The stratosphere is the very top layer of the atmosphere. You know, when you like launch something into the stratosphere, it's like, it's up there. It's because all the heat is being trapped at the lower levels <laughs> and it can't get out to the stratosphere anymore because it's being trapped in the troposphere, which is lower. It's being trapped on the surface. It's being trapped in the oceans. So we actually expect the stratosphere to cool under climate change because the energy is just not getting to it anymore. The heat's not getting there. Um, so then that's kind of an example uh, of, of something that may seem contradictory at first, you know, of, oh, you know, global warming's not real. Climate change isn't real because look at the stratosphere. It's, it's cooling. But you know, you, when you understand it in context, when you actually understand it, it of course shows that climate change is real because climate change is real and climate change is happening and there's nothing that's gonna show that it isn't because it is happening. <laughs> and it's like, it doesn't matter if you have a, you know, a graph like this. It doesn't matter if you have a graph of solar, solar irradiance that you know, maybe shows a trend. It's, you know, the, the basic principle is, is happening and there's no denying it. There's just no way around that fact. So, point number two. Do we see a rise in atmospheric greenhouse gases? Yes. <laughs> and here it is. So this is a very famous curve called the Keeling Curve. And it started back in about the 1960s. Um, a guy just went up to the Mauna Loa Observatory in Hawaii, set up a meteorological station, and began measuring carbon dioxide levels in the atmosphere. And that's shown um, by this black line here. Let me get my pointer. So the, black, the wiggly black line is the measurements taken from Hawaii. The less wiggly, red line are measurements taken at the South Pole in, our, in Antarctica. 
Um, and there's a few really interesting things that you can learn from this graph. Uh, and it teaches you a lot about climate change and where it's coming from. Um, one of them is, it's fairly subtle, but you can see, how much can I move around here? Um, <laughs> the lines are offsetting. This, there's a greater difference here than there was back in 1960. So what does that mean? It means that there's more carbon dioxide in the northern hemisphere than there is in the southern hemisphere. And why is that? Because most of the land mass on Earth is in the northern hemisphere. Most of the people on Earth are in the northern hemisphere. Most of the plants on Earth are in the northern hemisphere. And that's one of the other interesting things that you can see here. You can see the Earth breathing. The, the sawtooth pattern is caused by plant respiration and decomposition. So all the, the forests in the Northern Hemisphere, as they absorb carbon dioxide from the atmosphere in the spring and summer, they store it and it drops the, the measurable amount of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. And then as that, that extra uh, you know, leaf material, whatever, you know, falls off, decomposes in the fall and winter, carbon dioxide spikes back up. So you can see the effect of the seasons on, on the Earth's climate cycle. Um, so, but Regardless, it's going up. <laughs> it's going up very rapidly, uh, but it's, 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 dis it's distinguished between the northern and some of the southern hemispheres because we're putting it in the northern hemisphere. <laughs> and this is just focusing on the, the, the uh, Hawaiian Observatory, the Mauna Loa Observatory, and looking back to 1700. So pre-industrial revolution. Pre-industrial pre revolution, it looked pretty flat, right? You know, we didn't have this crazy whoosh, spike coming up the top here. Um, you know, so we weren't taking like real-time measurements. These are based on proxy measurements. So like gases uh, trapped in ice cores, tree rings, et cetera, et cetera. So it's not as fine, you know, fine-tuned as the, uh, the, the data that we've been actually measuring from the atmosphere the last, since 1960. Um, but what if we go back even further? What if we go back 10,000 years ago? Well, it still looks pretty flat. Darn it. <laughs> I guess it really is us. What if we go back even further? What if you're still not convinced? Well, you can go back 800,000 years, and it's still, I mean, you know, you can see these, these large fluctuations, but actually they're not as large as the fluctuation that we're causing. And really, we came at like the worst possible time because you can see, you know, troughs and peaks and, you know, troughs and then peaks, and we got to a peak, and then we jumped. <laughs> you know, we, we, we took off from the highest point that we could have, and so we're really kind of in a bad place here. You know, if we had started off at the bottom, we could have had, you know, a couple hundred more years of, you know, just burning fossil fuels, no problem. But, you know, darn, <laughs> we came along at a stable time in Earth's climate with, that allowed us to evolve into the species that we are today. And then we kind of started messing it up. So, but wait a minute, you say, what if, what about millions of years ago? What was the Earth's climate like then? Well, first of all, the Earth's climate wasn't simply determined by carbon dioxide. You know, it's, th there's a lot more going on than that. But we can still look back 400 million years using other types of proxy data like borehole data and stuff like that. And yes, carbon dioxide levels in the, upper, in the atmosphere were higher 400 million years ago. But you know what else was different 400 million years ago? We had supercontinents. <laughs> we had massive volcanic activity. We had a lot of other things that are going on today or that, that aren't going on today. You know what we do have today? We have people. And we have us pulling carbon out of long-term sinks that are fossil fuels, coal, oil, coal reserves, oil reserves, gas reserves, and burning it and putting it in the atmosphere. Um, here's another little, you know, kind of stratospheric cooling type example. You may have heard of the CO2 fertilization effect, and that's because plants use CO2, they breathe in CO2 and they breathe out oxygen, right? We have this nice, really nice relationship with plants. Um, so as we put more carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, will that increase the amount of plant growth? Well, yes, actually, it increases it quite a lot. And we can measure that and using satellite data of, uh, of chlorophyll. So we can actually, we know the, the, the exact spectrographic uh, fingerprint of chlorophyll. And so we shoot up satellites into space and we look for it. <laughs> and we can map continents that way and see the amount of vegetation on them. It's actually quite incredible. Um, but you can see that, you know, it in vegetation has increased, you know, anywhere from 20 to 30 percent a lot across a lot of the northern hemisphere. Um, so, you know, does that does that counteract climate change? Well, no, <laughs> because we still have this graph. You still have to address this graph. And you can see, actually, now that you know that you can see the Earth breathing in this graph, you can see relatively, you know, if you were to take all of the summer growth of all of the northern hemisphere and then decompose it and drop it in the atmosphere all at once, you get about that much change. <laughs> we're at that much change. So it's not the plants. The plants can't save us. 
unfortunately. They're trying. They're trying their hardest. Uh, <laughs> point three, changing carbon isotopes. So it's probably you know, been a little while since you last learned about isotopes, but you know, does anyone know what an isotope is? <laughs> Yes, yes, exactly. So it's an element that has a, a varying amounts of neutrons in its nucleus. So what determines an element is the number of protons in the nucleus, but it can have different amounts of neutrons. So carbon has three common types of isotopes. I put it in you know, quotations there because really 99% of it is carbon-12. So it's kind of the lightest form of, of commonly available carbon. Um, and then there's about 1% C13 uh, on the planet. And then there's about one in one trillion carbon molecule, carbon atoms on the planet are C14. And that's partially because C14 is radioactive, so it decays over time, so there's less and less of it. Well, except for what's being created by other radioactive reactions. Um, so, but the thing, the interesting thing about, about uh, carbon-12 is that uh, it's preferentially used in photosynthesis. So, and that's not because, you know, like, there's like bouncers hanging out on, you know, tree leaves and being like, you know, how many nuclei you got? You know, what, what you know, <laughs> how many neutrons you got in your nuclei? Um, they, it's just because the, the, the smaller atoms, the smaller carbon atoms, you know, because they have one less or two less uh, neutrons in the nucleus, they just move through the machinery of photosynthesis faster. It's like, you know, I don't know, it's just, it's easier, it's faster to move through. So you get more things created with carbon-12 because it's faster. And so most of the plant material on the planet and is, has more carbon-12 in it than other forms of carbon. And that's what these ratios are showing. So there's, you can measure the, the um, ratio of carbon-13 to carbon-12 or carbon-14 to carbon-12. And you get the delta C13, delta C14, just a little bit of jargon, sorry. Um, but basically the point is, is that we can fingerprint where different types of carbon are coming from. And particularly we can fingerprint very well fossil fuels because the carbon in them is very old. So it has almost no C14. So the C14 or the delta C14 ratio is very, very low. And the reason that it's like negative here and, you know, like a thousand or whatever is because it's, uh, it's a thousandth of percent minus one. Don't ask me why. Uh, <laughs> but we can measure this. We can measure these ratios in the atmosphere and we can see that it's decreasing. So and we can see again, so this is the same thing, sorry, this, this is the Mauna Loa Observatory in black and the, uh, the South Pole Observatory in red. And we can see again that it's coming from the Northern Hemisphere and it's increasing over time, well, decreasing over time on this particular one. Uh, <coughs> and we can measure this all across the globe. So these are, you don't really have to look at these, but um, this is Delta C13 and Delta C14 across different latitudes. So just goes from 90 south to 71 north and different observatories around the world are all picking up on exactly the same trends of we're pulling out very old carbon from fossil fuels and putting it up into the atmosphere. That's just the way that it is. We can see it. Number four, the atmospheric infrared absorption bands have not yet been saturated. And that's very jargony. <laughs> what does that mean? Well, if you remember this graph, you know, I, I circled the little IR absorption band. It's that the big dip right there. Um, so that's just how much energy is blocked by our atmosphere, right? Um, due to different greenhouse gases. Um, so what, okay. So what we can do is we can make a computer simulation of how our atmosphere works, how we know our atmosphere works and how it interacts with, you know, photons and things like that. Uh, and we can model that. So basically if you took this graph here and kind of bent it sideways and put some rainbow you know, lines over it <laughs> to make it pretty, you can, that's, that's what this is. This is showing the, the absorption of different wavelengths of light by our atmosphere at, at 270 parts per million of carbon dioxide. So that's, that's what the model input is right now. And we're at a balance. So we're at zero watts per meter squared energy imbalance. But if we were to say, bump it up to where we were like two years ago, <laughs> 400 parts per million of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere, we do get an energy imbalance. And uh, I want you to watch, let's see if I can, this, this particular part of the graph very closely. And I'm gonna go up and I'm gonna go back and forth as I increase. So we're gonna go up to 960 parts per million or 938 or something, and then back down. So just watch that part of the graph carefully. It changes, right? <laughs> yeah, it grows bigger as you put in more carbon dioxide and other greenhouse gases in the atmosphere, which means that this, the infrared absorption bands are not yet saturated, which means that we're still in a lot of trouble. <laughs> Um, 
because the more carbon dioxide and greenhouse gases we put up in the atmosphere, the hotter it's going to get. There's, it's not, it's not going to like plateau. You know, it's, we're not going to get to like, oh, you know, we got to 1,000, we're good from here. You know, like we don't, there's no more warming. No, it's going to keep warming as we put more carbon dioxide. So it really is a good motivation to try and bring down as, as much as we can, as quickly as can. Um, and then finally, five, natural climate forcings just cannot explain the trends that we're seeing. And so what are climate forcings? Climate forcings are all the things that we've been talking about so far. You know, continental arrangements, oceanic patterns, uh, continental arrangements, volcanic activity, planetary albedo, um, orbital cycles, Milankovitch cycles, good word, good word, Milankovitch cycles. That's just talking about how the Earth moves around the sun and, you know, how, how its orbit changes and things like that. It's wobble, it's precession, it's eccentricity. Um, things that are responsible for, like, the seasons. Uh, and then, you know, greenhouse gases and land use changes and things like that. Um, and this is just showing kind of the relative uh, influence of each different type of uh, forcing. So all this stuff over here are greenhouse gases. So by far, you know, when you add them all together, they're much bigger than reflective aerosols or land use changes. You know, and the sun has a small effect because it kind of varies back and forth. But by and large, this is the same thing, just in a, a graphical format. Um, so what we're trying to explain here are these surface temperature anomalies, right? So the anomaly is just how far off from the global average temperature has the Earth been over, you know, the last hundred something years. So that's what we're trying to explain with the different climate forcing. So we can take a look at uh, those different things like, you know, how much energy is the sun putting out? Well, it, it actually fluctuates, you know, it kind of goes, it has these long trends and short trends, but we know what the trends are basically, you know, so we can, we can account for them in our models. How much are volcanoes exploding? Well, we can measure that as well, you know, and, and that actually has a negative effect on uh, global temperature, as you may know, um, because they put up a bunch of aerosols, they put up a bunch of soot that block, that physically block the sun from reaching the Earth's atmosphere. Um, and then also, you know, climate is messy, climate is complicated, and so it has a lot of natural internal variability to the system. You know, it's like a wobbling top. You know, you never quite know which, which way it's going to wobble one moment or the next, but you know it's going to wobble. And so we can take that into account as well. And we can account for all of this stuff. The one thing that we can't account for is this, the anthropogenic component. And this is the, the, this is the, uh, the anomaly that's due to burning of fossil fuels and land use changes, all the things that we are responsible for. And th it's the only one of all of these that is actually increasing. So clearly it must be the burning of fossil fuels that's causing this temperature anomaly. Not the other stuff. And this one is basically the same thing. I just wanted to show you um, the effect of the ENSO. That is the fancy scientific uh, abbreviation for El Nino and La Nina. So we also can account for that. And we know that it actually just kind of overlays on climate change and makes it worse, as we've seen. Um, so those are the kind of the main points of evidence for climate change. Uh, and I just wanted to... Um, really briefly mention uh, the, uh, the, the, the groups, the research agencies that, that do this research and that put it out and that communicate it. Because that's, you know, how, how else are you going to know it? And, you know, who's the one, who are the people that are doing it? Everyone has a bias. You know, even scientists have a bias. So you have to understand who's doing the science and where is it coming from. Um, and a lot of the science that has been communicated to the public and particularly to politicians, to policymakers around the world, comes from the IPCC from the International, sorry, Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. Uh, and that's part of the UN, it was founded in 1988. Uh, it's a massive organization, um, and they don't do their own original research, they do basically review research. So they take, uh, they take research from the literature, so all the, all the climate change research that's being done at universities and research centers around the globe, and they condense it, they you know, interpret it, and they present it in a format that's understandable to, to you and me and policymakers. And, um, so that's actually one of the assignments that you've got uh, today, uh, reading assignments is at the summary for the most recent IPCC report, which isn't that recent, it's six years old, but we've got another one coming out in 2021, 2022, so we'll be able to get some new data soon. Um, and just to give you an idea of the scale, how many people are involved in the writing of, you know, the, these, these, you know, thousand page reports, it took, the last report took six years almost 2,000 writers and editors from 80 countries and 140,000 review comments. And I don't know, <laughs> I would go crazy if I had to deal with that many review comments on a paper. It, that's just insane. Um, but these are some of the kind of the main um, US-based programs, if you're curious to look more into them. 
Um, so we've got the National Climate Assessment, climate.gov, and climate, uh, the NASA climate website. And these are all pretty good resources if, as you're doing you know, research for your first paper, which we're going to talk about in just a minute. Um, these are good resources for you to have. And, but you know, these agencies uh, and these research groups are only as, you know, as only, they're only as good as the people that run them. And uh, that's something that we're going to talk about um, for the writing prompt, which we'll talk about in just a moment. But I just wanted to, you know, throw up a cute talk on the screen while we take questions. So, yes. So that's a, that's a good question, and I'll just repeat it uh, for everybody, um, saying that the human population curve can overlay the Keeling curve. Uh, and that's, that's a really good point, and the human population is definitely increasing. There's no doubt about that. Um, but you have to look at where the population is increasing, and you know, like, who are the people that are actually having their population growth? The United States is fairly stagnant population growth, and historically, we are the ones most responsible for climate change emissions, you know, or the emissions that are causing climate change. Um, so our emissions are still growing, <laughs> but our population is not. Um, India, the population is exploding, but their carbon footprint per person, per capita carbon footprint is tiny. It's, it's like a fraction of an American's. Same thing with China. There's way more people, but their carbon emissions are actually growing because they're trying to have a more American lifestyle. They're eating more beef, they're driving more cars, they're burning more coal. So they're, they're trying to be more like Americans, who again, are not experiencing a population increase. So the population problem is definitely something that you know, needs to be considered. Um, but as far as everything that I've seen, it is not the main driver for any of these factors. It's, it's more about the politics and the culture and the lifestyle than, than about the, the exact population within that, within each country. Yes. Yeah, absolutely. Um, <clears throat> so there's uh, different types of fossil fuels have different carbon intensities. Um, so how much energy it takes to get them out of the ground, how much energy it takes to process them, and how much energy it takes to burn them. Um, you know, because you have to put in a little bit of energy to combust a hydrocarbon, right? According to Climate Science 101, you all just learned, you have to put in a little bit of energy to burn them. <laughs> um, so each, each different type of fossil fuel uh, has a different carbon intensity. So that's you know, the amount of greenhouse gases that are released when a given unit of that fossil fuel is, is burned. Um, so like the oil that we produce here in California has a very high carbon intensity. And if you don't know, we produce a lot of oil in California. Go down to San Ardo, go to Kern County, you'll see you know, the whatever they're called, the, the oil rigs, <laughs> the oil drills there. Um, it's so carbon intensive because it's very thick. It's very dirty, crude oil. Uh, we have to put in a lot of energy to get it out of the ground because it's basically like, like tar. You know, it's like molasses when it's underground. And so you have to heat up water, turn it into steam, which takes a lot of energy, and then you pump it into the ground and it kind of like loosens everything up. You give like, basically you, give, you melt the oil until it flows and then you can pump it out. And then you have to process it, <laughs> which is a dirty process as well. You get a bunch of byproducts and um, the, the oil here in California has a lot of sulfur in it and you have to do something with that sulfur because if you burn it in, you know, in your truck or whatever, then you get sulfates or uh, sulf sulfur dioxide in the atmosphere, which causes acid rain. And we have outlawed that as a country where we're trying to move away from that. So you have to get rid of that, which takes extra energy. You know? and same thing with like coal. You know, it, coal actually is uh, quite dirty, as you know, but um, it's dirty because it has a lot of metals, it has a lot of sulfur, and it also takes a lot of energy to, you know, rip apart mountain ranges to get at it, which we love to do for some reason. Um, yeah, so I think hopefully that answers your question. <laughs> yeah, anybody else? Yes? What are the effects of forest fires on global warming? We've had forest fires in California a lot more lately. Yeah. So curious if you've had those on it itself. Yes, indeed. Um, yeah, and we'll, we'll talk more about that next time, um, but I'll give you a sneak peek today. Uh, basically, f wildfires, or I mean, you know, how, how wild can you say that they are now, you know, especially here in California, um, they're, they're growing more intense, they're growing more frequent, and the wildfire seasons are growing longer. And that's just a consequence of 
there's more heat everywhere. You know, things are hotter, things are drier, rainfall patterns are shifting, um, plants become more susceptible to predator or to diseases, to pests like bark beetle. Um, so you get a lot of dead trees that are then burned very easily and very intensely. And they burn so much that they will basically like crystallize the soil which is something that wildfires shouldn't really do and they haven't done in the past, you know, in, in, in except in other instances of climate change like we're in now. Um, and they can prevent uh, new things from growing back. So, you know, uh, a natural wildfire should be light, you know, it should be just a clearing out of the underbrush and uh, that stimulates new things to grow. But these are massive, long-lived, very intense wildfires that just destroy. And so the, the fundamental nature of the fires that we're experiencing is also changing in climate change. Anybody else? Yeah. So it seems like the science is pretty clear. Um, what about like the solutions then, in terms of like our own ingenuity, in terms of like developing technologies to kind of deal with this? Like, do we have any sort of viable carbon sequestering technologies? Like, is there any sort of you mentioned geothermal engineering? Like, is that is it possible to like engineer the atmosphere to cool this so that you're not able to actually adapt and? Uh, what are the solutions to this scientific problem? There's a lot of solutions. We have all the solutions that we need. There's a lot of solutions. We have all the solutions that we need, except for the political ones. Um, so we have, you know, we have renewable energy technologies. We've had renewable energy technologies for a long time. And in fact, we could have had clean nuclear <laughs> since the Nixon administration, but he decided that he wanted to do uranium-based uh, uh, nuclear reactions instead of thorium-based nuclear reactions so that he could produce fissile materials to make bombs because thorium reactions don't have super toxic radioactive waste. But you never heard of them, have you? You never heard of thorium reactors. Look it up. <laughs> um, so that's, that, that would be one thing, you know, if, if instead of deciding to uh, create a massive weapon stockpile, we had instead decided to pursue clean, limitless energy, we could have done that. But instead we decided to make nuclear weapons. So we also have a lot of um, energy storage techniques that we can use that are very, you know, not, they're not, they don't require a lot of fancy technology. Um, one of them is pumped hydro. I don't know if you, you're familiar with that, but basically it's when you have a pool or a pond or a lake or something at the top of a hill and you pump it up and down the hill as you get more or less energy. So you can, you can pump it up the hill using energy as a way to store energy and then you run it back down the hill through a turbine, like a, you know, like a dam or whatever, um, to produce energy. And that's, it's basically, you know, it's very close to perfect efficiency. <laughs> uh, it's, it's very low environmental impact. There's literally tens of thousands of sites across the country and millions of sites across the world that it, this could be done in. Uh, it doesn't require fancy technology. You just have to get a hill <laughs> and some pipes and a turbine, you know, a place to get the water to and from. Um, we have geothermal energy, which, you know, any, any house in the United States can do. We ha it, used to, it used to be the thinking that um, geothermal energy was really hard to tap. That's, that's energy, heat energy that we can pull out of the ground and use to do work. Um, so, you know, it gets really hot underneath the ground because of all the tectonic activity, all the radioactivity, you know, et cetera, et cetera. Um, and we can take that heat and we can boil it, boil water with it and use that steam to do work. Uh, and that's geothermal energy in a nutshell. But we used to think that you had to have these big, you know, big factories and things like that. And you can still do that. But any house can do it now. We have the technology to basically sink a little thing in, your, in the foundations of your house that will allow you to pull, to do heat exchange with the earth from your house. And that would be a great way to save energy. But, you know, again, it would take a little bit of investment. It would take the political will to do that. Um, but we have intentionally as a society, well, the people in charge of our society have intentionally chosen the route of fossil fuels and uranium, plutonium, nuclear power. Um, yeah. So we, we, have, we have the answers. We just need to do them. What about with like getting carbon out of the atmosphere? Oh yeah, carbon sequestration. Yes, thank you. I was gonna um, mention soil. Soil, and this is uh, something that um, actually we're trying to get involved in is soil carbon sequestration. Um, so again, no fancy technology. <laughs> you just take all the stuff that you throw away in the landfill, you turn it into compost, and then you spread it on the soil, and then the soil sucks up all that extra carbon, and instead of now, instead of all that stuff rotting in your landfill and turning into carbon dioxide and methane, you're sequestering into the soil, and you're making your soil healthier, you're making it 
more fertile. You're making it uh, have a greater water holding capacity. You're making it less susceptible to erosion. You're increasing the amount of beneficial organisms in the soil and you're massively sequestering carbon. And you can do this all across California. You can do this all across the United States. Uh, we just need to do it. And we, it's kind of, we, we understand the concept, but the research is still in fairly early stages. Um, there's the Marin Carbon Project. They've kind of, they're kind of probably the most well-known one if you want to check them out. Um, but carbon, soil carbon sequestration is basically what we need to do. All the stuff with the big fans and, you know, the pumps. And, you know, if you've seen that, <laughs> that thing in Sweden or Switzerland or whatever where they have the, you know, they basically suck carbon dioxide out of the air with, like, giant fans and, like, put it into the ground where it just comes back out anyway. <laughs> it's, like, it's, it's like a bad joke. I mean, when I saw that, I was like, what are you <laughs> using a massive amount of energy when you could just be taking your trash and throwing it on a field, literally? <laughs> um, so... Geoengineering uh, or, you know, stuff like that um, is something that is very risky. I mean, basically, we're already geoengineering with climate change. So we're, we're, you know, we're, we're geoengineering by pumping out massive amounts of greenhouse gases. Um, but this is like a very reckless and uncontrolled type of geoengineering. However, most types of geoengineering would probably be quite reckless because it's very hard to predict uh, how the planet will respond to things that we haven't seen before. So like if we were to, you know, say launch a bunch of mirrors into outer space, you know, to reflect, that would probably be, you know, close to okay, but you know, what if something happens to those mirrors? What if they fall out of space, fall out of somebody's head? You know, I don't know. There's all kinds of things that people don't consider when they're thinking about geoengineering because they're like, technology will save our problems. And that's, it's really more of a mindset issue than like a, you know, any kind of technological one of, of we can keep doing what we're doing because we enable ourselves because we'll just magically come up with a technology that will solve all of our problems. But we have the things that we already need. We don't need to look for magic solutions like, you know, pumping a bunch of iron fillings into the oceans and causing phytoplankton blooms. You know, somebody just, I don't know if you, several years ago, somebody just, like a rich guy, just went out and bought a bunch of iron shavings and dumped them into the ocean <laughs> to cause a massive phytoplankton bloom, which would, he thought, sequester carbon in the deep oceans. It didn't. And, you know, it kind of messed up that ecosystem for a while and brought in a bunch of iron, which wasn't good, but um, he did it and he did it by himself. And so that's, you know, that may be kind of the future of what we're looking at, you know, just people like Elon Musk or, you know, whatever it, rich, uh, motivated people who are just want to come in and solve problems, <laughs> you know, like building little submarines to get boys out of caves instead of just training them to use the, the things that they need. Um, yeah. I think that's all I had to say about junior engineering. Any, any other questions? <laughs> Otherwise, we, yeah. Well, considering, I guess, climate change is a global problem, how do we reconcile national sovereignty with this issue of controlling what people do with their... That's, that's, that's that you could teach an entire course about that question, <laughs> trying to answer that question. Um, I mean, on a kind of like the most large scale, it's, it's, a, it's a philosophical, well, like kind of eco-philosophical problem well, the tragedy of the commons. It's how do you, when you have a common resource, in this case, the atmosphere, how do you prevent independent parties from just exploiting it when they don't suffer any immediate consequences? And that's, that's, that's a really tricky problem. You know, that gets into like all kinds of like game theory things and, you know, psycho psychology quirks and stuff like that. But um, I mean, basically, I mean, I believe you can solve problems through, you know, stuff like this, through education, through real education, not, you know, propaganda <laughs> um, and, you know, politically mo motivated things, but everyone coming to the realization that this is a real problem and we need to figure out how we're going to solve it. Um, because right now, you know, we, we've, we've kind of whiffled and waffled and, you know, been, well, we can kick the ball a little bit down the road, you know, maybe we'll come up with, you know, some giant air pump that we can just suck all the carbon dioxide out with and, you know, we'll be fine. Um, but we can't do that. <laughs> yeah. Um, off of that last question, can you speak to the role of indigenous communities in bringing down global climate? Yes. Um, yeah, and I absolutely. So we do a lot of work with indigenous communities, and um, it's really uh, shocking to see kind of, you know, I mean, I, I haven't, seen so much firsthand, but, you know, kind of secondhand, like for right, right now, this class was supposed to have two TAs. I was supposed to be co-teeing it with someone else and they're out uh, and the, at the Pine Ridge Reservation dealing with the flooding that's happening there um, and trying to coordinate with, you know, the, the local leaders out there to, to get in 
FEMA because <laughs> they FEMA is like, oh, it's not an emergency. It's no problem. You know, you guys, you literally flooded out of your homes and you have no access to, you know, infrastructure or roadways or anything like that. Um, and this is just prime, a prime example of how indigenous communities are uh, in, in, uh, completely unequally impacted by the effects of climate change. And which is, you know, insane because these are the ones, these are the people that have been trying to stop us from doing all the things that we've done to the planet all along the way, you know. Uh, and, you know, in places like the Amazon, um, there's, the, there, there's tribes there that are rainforest protectors. You know, they live in the rainforest, they've lived in the rainforest since time immemorial, and they actually increase the biodiversity of the environments that they live in. If you take away the people, the indigenous people from a land, it, it becomes less productive, it becomes less, you know, healthy. <laughs> because people should be an integral part of the land. We should be an integral part of the ecosystem. But, you know, this, this particular mindset that we seem to have gotten into in a Western culture is, you know, we can take as much as we want from the land and, you know, take as much as we want from nature. Um, and we're seeing the consequences of that. We're seeing it, you know, more and more each year. And uh, the, 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 the messages that you know, the indigenous people of, you know, this continent, South America, of, you know, all the continents have been trying to tell us is that ain't going to work out. <laughs> and it hasn't. So, I mean, you know, I, I don't know if that kind of speaks to your, your question, but yeah. Um, you mentioned earlier about the last great extinction. Um, I know we are currently in the midst of another mass extinction. Um, on like the topic of indigenous lands, I've heard that like a lot of biodiversity is on indigenous lands still, like more than 50% globally. Um, I'm curious, what are the main factors in these extinctions? Like, is it like this habitat loss or urbanization, or is it? It's it's a it's a combination of things because you know if it if it w basically if it wasn't a combination of a million different factors, it probably wouldn't be happening. So it's it's things getting hotter. You know, it's 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 climate change. Uh, uh, you know, or global warming, sorry, it's things getting hotter, it's things getting drier, or things getting wetter, you know, precipitation patterns will shift, and we'll go through a lot of this uh, next time, you know, about what the particular impacts are, but um, they become more, yeah, I, I was mentioning earlier, they become more susceptible to disease, like plants, you know, trees become more susceptible to bark beetle here, you know, when, when they're stressed for water, and they're stressed for heat, uh, and so if you don't have, basically, if you start to, to you know, flick one domino, they start to come down. And the more you flick, the more, you know, th they start to come down. So um, there's basically just a lot of interconnected things that, it, you know, it's hard to pick out one thing in particular, but land, u land, land, uh, land use changes. So like burning down the Amazon, massive, massive, you know, biodiversity loss there. Um, and, you know, and it never comes back. Like I was mentioning earlier, you know, the rainforest brings the rain. So if you cut down the rainforest, the rain goes away and then the rainforest doesn't come back. <laughs> yeah. So do you hinted at how education could be a major factor contributing to understanding climate change. And when it comes to education, I, I understand that you, your background is more on the scientific analysis of it, so that's why we so the numbers, the statistics, the, we were educated under a different, different perspective, right? But I was going to ask a question on whether or not you're going to cover more of the corporatocracy or the effects of capitalism on climate change and the effects of that with like political uh, backdrop and how that's going to affect cultural norms and how that could uh, you are <laughs> in the writing assignment, the first one. So, um, so basically, what I wanted to give you today uh, and and tomorrow, or sorry, Thursday, um, is is like a factual underpinning that you can do a lot of these thinking. You know, you can do a lot of these analyses uh, yourself. But we're also going to be covering it. You know, more stuff like that in the class. So you'll see where the roots of all this came from, you know, where, where these particular mindsets arose from, the particular people that they came from. Um, uh, and also, we've got a lot of stuff in the readings, which, so thank you for reminding me because I totally forgot to mention. So these um, are the assigned uh, readings and materials for the class. Um, there's the books that Danny was mentioning last time. Um, and th these are all in your syllabus. Um, we've got these two copies. They all just came in off, <laughs> off uh, in the mail. Um, so we got them today, and I'm going to put them up in the course reserve um, either, t I don't know if I can still do it today, but tomorrow or, or Thursday at the latest. Um, but if you want to, you know, come check them out after class, you can do that as well. But um, Naomi Klein, this book is a really excellent answer to your question, if you haven't read it already. Yes. Yeah. Yeah. She's, she's, uh, she's really great. What were you going to say? 
Oh, we do? Oh, awesome. Oh, great. Well, you don't have to buy that book or check it out. We've got it on the PDF form. Um, yeah, so uh, did you have a question before I... Uh, so this is that's a um, very politically you know tricky question to answer because a lot of the times the the less developed countries are the ones that are more affected by climate change as well. So you know they're like, well, you know, you guys messed everything up, so now we have to develop really quickly so that we don't just die out when the constant when you know your chickens come home to roost for us. So uh, it is a very tricky question, and you know particularly for some places like India yeah. or China you know, where they're, they're building more coal plants <laughs> when we can't build any new coal plants. And, but they're like, well, you know, our people are poor and they're, they're starving and they're suffering and, you know, they're, it's going to get worse. You know, what are we supposed to do? Basically, it needs to be countries like us that change first. And the fact that we are so stubborn as a country about changing and we have done, uh, there's a, a sign reading um, about the Paris Agreement that I, uh, that I recommend. Um, that you know made me tear up because I was just so frustrated reading it because you know it's exactly this kind of thing of, of the most privileged wealthiest countries in the world who are most responsible for climate change are the ones that are like no 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 you do something first you know and it's just it's absurd and that's why part of the reason why the political situation is so intractable um, yeah so it's it's that's a big question and there's not a good answer for it <laughs> um, any other questions before I start talking about the writing assignment <laughs> Okay, um, so first writing assignment is uh, due in class on Thursday, April 25th. Uh, five to six pages, nothing crazy, double spaced, extra nothing crazy. Um, and basically, you know, we came up with these three prompts, but if you have another idea, and you know, like we have some great questions here today that could definitely turn into a paper, um, you know, you can come see me after class today or after th on Thursday, email me or Danny or whatever. Um, but these are the ones that we came up with. So number one, how accurate are representations of climate change in the news and popular media, and how have they influenced public perception and policy action around climate change? And what role does scientific literacy play in that? So that's a big question. You, know, you, can, you can choose to narrow in on one particular aspect, or you can you know, keep it general. Uh, why have, number two, why have climate change tipping points and or feedback loops largely been left out of discussions on global climate action? And what, if any, impact has this had on the creation of climate change policies? So we talked a little bit about uh, uh, feedback loops today. We'll talk more about tipping points on Thursday, so you'll have a little bit more ammunition for this question. Um, and then number three, the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change has been the global standard for climate science for decades. Uh, discuss the strengths and weaknesses of the IPC model of globalized, politicized scientific research in the context of the IPCC's role in stimulating global climate change policies. So. Um, we talked a little bit about the IPCC right at the end, um, but uh, there's a lot more resources, including some critiques of the IPCC in the readings for today and Thursday. So uh, if you're interested in that prompt, I would recommend those to you as well. Um, yeah? Are our papers any more research paper oriented? Like, do we have to derive all of our notes or all our facts from the readings, or do we focus more so on outside sources? Um, I you know, we provided you with a lot of resources, but if you want to answer a question that isn't, you know, the, the answer isn't in any of the materials, of course, seek outside resources, yeah. So this is not just, this is not all, you know, what, what we gave you is not everything that we expect you to look at, so. Um, yeah. Any other questions about the prompts? You want to pick my brain a little bit, but I think we got a little bit more time um, for these. If you want to uh, talk about the, the prompts, I'm just going to turn off my alarm here. If not, uh, then we can just get out a little bit early. It's a nice day. <laughs> yeah. Um, what, what role would Trump play in replacing the use of hemp? I mean, hemp is a very incredibly versatile <laughs> plant uh, that can be used for a variety of really useful things, you know, rope, paper, all kinds of textiles, you know, other types of products, um, and it grows really quickly, and it uh, doesn't use up a lot of nutrients in the soil, um, and the United States doesn't like it because it hasn't associated with marijuana, <laughs> and so we haven't used it, and that's the reason why.
and it's not for any re and it's not for any good reason. It's just for that reason. Yeah. So we should definitely be using hemp. And in fact, some some uh, indigenous um, organizations or some indigenous groups are trying to, you know, increase the hemp growth or like you know whatever increase hemp agriculture in this country because they're not, you know, necessarily beholden to all the same rules and regulations. So. If I can give like a brief announcement about climate activism going yes. on in this community. Yeah, you go ahead. Cool. Um, so many of the students here or the uh, other guests are looking to get their hands on in terms of like pushing policy and pushing politicians in the right direction and banks and all that kind of stuff. So please come talk to me at some point because I'm with the uh, local Sunrise chapter in which we are currently organizing the youth to move the government in the right direction in line with science and justice. Um, upcoming tomorrow, we actually have a bank action in coordination with uh, Sanford's Climate Action Network, where we'll be out uh, uh, front of Wells Fargo doing a little bit of some street theater for any actors in the room. Um, so yeah, please, uh, please come speak if you want to get, uh, get your hands dirty. Your voice is heard. Your hands dirty, your voice is heard. Uh, yes, the last two classes are online. Oh yeah, yes, yes, thank you. Um, the last two lectures are up on the syllabus and on our YouTube channel. So if you missed them or you wanna check them out for notes, um, they're both up there. And this one will be up there shortly, either probably tomorrow or Thursday. Um, I, think, I think that's it, if there's no more questions, go have a great rest of your Tuesday. <laughs>